Well, I will continue to echo the many thanks for those who've brought us here, Cardinal Supic, Jim, uh, and Tony especially, thank you for orga organizing and orchestrating. Uh, we've got a great opportunity after all of our panels and discussions now to really think collectively about what we do from here. And in order to kind of set up that discussion, which will come at the end of our panel, uh, we've got three tremendous panelists. Uh, we'll start with Bishop Overbeck here from Essen, who will kind of give some discussion of how Germany has begun to handle the implementation process. Uh, Archbishop Schluna from Malta will talk how the Maltese experience has unfolded. And Archbishop Gregory will finish us out discussing uh, where Atlanta's going with this, I believe. So without any further ado, uh, Bishop Overbeck, thank you. Dear Cardinal Tupic, thank you very much for the invitation and also kind regards from our Bishop of Conference in Germany, from Cardinal Marx and all the other brothers, the brothers and sisters. The post synodal exhortation and Maurice Letizia has been taken up very positively in Germany. The aim to empower the institutions of marriage and family, the encouraging style of the document and the everyday language of Pope Francis hit the heart of many people in Germany. The surveys made in preparation for the synods in 2014 and 15 received a wide response all over Germany, and not only in the church. The participation of the German bishops in the synods attracted great attention, as you know. The publication of Amoris Laetitia created high expectations towards the reaction of us, the German bishops. Prior to the synodal way, already the German bishops, we had planned to publish a statement concerning marriage and family in 2012. Furthermore, the question of pastoral handling of remarried divorces, intensively discussed in Germany since long, as you know, had been of great importance in the context even before the synod. Against this background, the German bishops intended to provide an impulse for a deepened reception and an application of the propositions of uh, Maurice Letizia on the responsible situation in Germany. Thereby, the source of a Maurice should neither be repeated nor commented on. Therefore, after intensive discussions among the bishops and us, a short text as impulse has been published showing shortly which aspects of Amoris Letizia are considered as very important in the current pastoral situation in our homeland. This text is also available in English. The text underlines that the marriage preparation and attendance of couples have to be intensified in accordance with Amoris Letizia. It points out the importance of strengthening and granting support to the family as a place to learn about faith. And finally, the text emphasizes the importance of accompanying, discerning, and integrating for the handling of fragility. First of all, divorced Catholics who got remarried by civil marriage are invited to approach their local church to join as life and to become active parish members step by step. According to a Maurice Letizia, there cannot be general valid regulation or autonomism for granting sacraments. Differentiated solutions are necessary, which are sheltered to the individual case, to the individual biography and life situation. We, the German bishops, assuming that Emeritus Letizia initiates a process toward decisions of conscience, and according to them, the process should be assisted by a pastor or a pastoral caretaker. A spiritual process like this, that always comprises inclusion, does not inevitably lead to the reception of the sacrament of penance and reconciliation, also as of the sacrament of Eucharist. It is above all the distinction in Latin discretio made in a confidential dialogue. If resulting of this process, the faithful makes a decision to receive the sacrament, <coughs> this has to be respected. This demands not only to strengthen pastoral caretakers' capability to have conversation, but also to strengthen the growing of conscience of the faithful. The text points out that these necessities reflect the demand of high tasks for our pastoral care. 
Our text ends with the invitation to get into Amoris Laetitia and to get involved in the impetus of Pope Francis. If one now asks the question with theological sources the German bishops, or we, particularly choose as basis for the reception of Amoris Laetitia, the following five aspects can be briefly described. The first, the life of people we meet in parish. The reaction to pre-synodal surveys contributed to the findings with theology regarding marriage and family problems must deal with. The majorities of Catholics in Germany highly appreciated the institution of marriage and family. Especially the young people, it is of great value to manage a successful partnership and family and also family life. Nevertheless, people are aware of fragility and of all the difficulties on their way realizing these aims of life. They want their church to give them orientation, strengthening and practical support. But only few people in Germany understand and accept the ethical sense of interdictions. So especially in the field of sexuality, interdictions that one cannot understand that are seen as ignorant and patronizing are no longer obeyed. Well, whoever wants people to adopt moral demands has to formulate clearly his position. Furthermore, he has to explain his position in a comprehensive way and to teach people to appreciate this position. People regard themselves as individual organizers of their own life in a very multifarious and complex world. Therefore, they examine carefully the individual requirements for their own course of life. Second, the reflections of an Episcopal work group and a theological symposium. Already in 2012, as I said, the German bishops, we, set up an Episcopal work group dealing with the question of the pastoral handling of remarried divorces in detail. When Pope Francis anticipated the synod process, the German bishops forwarded the results of their consultation as a theological contribution for the preparation of the synod to the synod secretariat. The text was also published in English under the title Theologically Responsible, Pastorally Appropriate Ways of Assisting Remarried Divorces, Reflections on the German Bishops' Conference in Preparation of the Synod of Bishops on the Pastoral Challenges. Between the two synods in 2014 and 15, the presidents of the conferences of France, German and Swiss initiated a conference at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. This conference, that took place with considerable theologians from three countries, dealt with considerations about Bible hermeneutics in respect of marriage and family, aspects of a theology of love, and thoughts of a theology of biography. The theological contributions and a summary of the subjects of discussion were published with the title Theology of Love in German, French, and English and Italian. Third, the propositions from Gaudium et Spes concerning the conscience. In respect of the shortness of time, I only a few ex ex exemplary reference can be named by me. A theological reference of prominent importance to the reception of Amoris Laetitia in regard of the pastoral handling with difficult situations where the propositions of the Council Constitution Gaudium et Spes concerning the conscience in number eight, 16. Pope Francis emphasized the importance of the human conscience in Amoris Laetitia several times. That was impulse and encouragement to recall the statement of the Second Vatican. Council dealing with the conscience and to reflect the impact of the imparting of the Christian doctrine in the world. Already in the deliberations for the Circulus Germanicus during the Synod of 2015, those council statements played an important role. So the council states, Conscience is the most secret core and sanctuary of a man, there he is alone with the God, whose voice echoes in his depths. 
Therefore, the conscience of the individual person is to be respected as well as the person needs to be reminded and educated to hold faith to the conscience and give it space in one's own life. This is what we understand by formation of the conscience. It happens especially when the respective person takes the Christian doctrine seriously, deals with it, and endeavors to integrate the doctrine in his life. For the pastoral care, the clear appeal from Pope Francis applies, we have been called to form the conscience, not to replace them. Fourth, the fundamental impulse of St. Thomas Aquinas. The president of the pastoral commission of our German bishops' conference, Bishop Franz Josef Bode from Osnabrück, addressed some significant thoughts of St. Thomas Aquinas in his intervention and in the discussion of the Circulus Germanicus on the Synod 2015. Thomas emphasizes that each norm has to be applied to everyday life of men and that the precision of theoretical regulation does not grant this and therefore the situation needs to be taken into account. The fact that Pope Francis explicitly used the argument of St. Thomas in Amor Letizia, in number 304, was a confirmation and an encouragement, in complete according with the doctrinal tradition, to emphasize the importance of the individual biography for the pastoral care, since it is an old knowledge that general norms and rules are not always distinct enough when they are applied on specific situations, it is not always possible for everyone to understand the exactly meaning of a rule and sometimes it is also not feasible to capture the situation in a rule. This is when human prudence is demanded to make the best out of the situation. This is, can implicate to modify a rule or to give preference to a competing rule because otherwise a reasonable behavior would be impossible. St. Thomas himself alludes that a rule cannot capture the complexity of a human action or situations. Pope Francis makes this rational theory of action valuable for the pastoral care of his churches, of the churches, for it reveals prudent. Action is clearly not fiddle or laxism. It is rather indispensable when one wants to achieve reasonable goals. Therefore, the pastoral care takes needs to act prudently in the sense of the Christian doctrine and in the light of compassion that Christian actively inherently determines. Fifth, Pope Francis and Amoris Laetitia, I will conclude. At the end, let us mention the most important theological reference of the German bishop's conference and reception. These are Pope Francis himself and Amoris Laetitia. This profound text refers not only to the tradition of the Church in a detailed way, but also to the reflection of the Synod. And it combines, in part, very personal reflections, thoughts, advices, and remarks of Pope Francis himself to homogeneous statement. Amoris is both a teaching statement as well as a skillful and almost elaborated synthesis. A very pleasing fact of the text is that the Pope neither changes dogmatic proportion nor formulates new principles. On the contrary, he reduces things to their main issues. To the love described in the Gospel, the love that should be lived in marriage and in family every single day. Pope Francis says, for we cannot encourage a path of fidelity and mutual self-giving without encouraging the growth, strengthening and deepening a conjugal and family love. Where love is, there is God, and he calls us to this active love no matter in which situation we are living. Beside all discussion concerning the importance and the, of the message of a Moritz teacher, we should not forget that the Pope considers the importance of love and the encouragement to love as the essential message of his post synodal text. Especially these reflections, hints and advices dealing with the implementation of love in everyday life of married people and families create a very personal and realistic touch. In a moral teacher that at the same time evokes the ethos 
of accompanying, distincting, and integration that Pope Francis demands in the same letter. In the importance of love in the life of mankind, a Maurice has its essence and its initial point for a further thoughts. A lot can be rediscovered in this new, but in the same way, old and traditional perspective. Against this background and fed from these theological sources, the discussion of the reception of Amoris Laetitia took place in our bishop's conference. In this line, we are working to strengthen our marriage and family pastoral care. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I will turn over to Archbishop Charles Shikluna from Malta. I was asked to present a, a number of theological principles uh, at the basis of um, our document. And the first theological principle behind the publication of the criteria for the application of chapter eight of Amoris Letizia, published in January uh, 2017 by the undersigned as Archbishop of Malta and by Monsignor Mario Grech, Bishop of Gozo. The first principle is the principle of affective collegiality and communion with the Holy Father. The doctrine at the source of this principle was outlined authoritatively in the dogmatic constitution of the Second Vatican Council Lumen Gentium. The criteria, therefore, are an expression of and commitment to communion with the magisterium of the Supreme Pontiff and with the authentic Catholic tradition. Our guidelines interpret Amoris Laetitia through the lens of the entire tradition of the Church. The French presentation of doctrine and Amoris Laetitia cannot be interpreted adequately without taking into account the gospel's core message of merciful love, the theological insights of Thomas Aquinas, the renewal of the Second Vatican Council, as well as the teachings of the recent popes. The pastoral framework of our guidelines reflects a hermeneutical continuity rather than a hermeneutics of rupture. On a personal note, I have always been moved by the strong words Pope Francis uses in Amoris number 308 when he describes his strong conviction that what he is teaching the church at this time corresponds to the will of Jesus. And I quote, I understand those, says the Pope, who prefer a more rigorous pastoral care which leaves no room for confusion. But I sincerely believe, says the Pope, that Jesus wants a church attentive to the goodness which the Holy Spirit sows in the midst of human weakness, a mother who, while clearly expressing her objective teaching, always does what good she can, even if in the process her shoes get soiled by the mud of the street. And that's the end of the quote. We are called to be faithful to the teachings of the Lord Jesus on the indissolubility of the marriage bond, and at the same time be faithful to his mission of mercy and forgiveness, discernment and care. The guidelines of the Maltese bishops make it a point to quote the words of the Holy Father as much as possible. Indeed, 60% of the text is formed of direct quotes from Amoris Laetitia. They are an expression of that sentire cum ecclesia, which especially for us bishops implies a sentire cum petro. A second theological principle follows the teaching of the pastoral constitution of the Second Vatican Council Gaudium et Spes on the relevance of the signs of the times and the humble search for the will of Jesus for his church and her mission in today's world. To quote Gaudium et Spes three, inspired by no earthly ambition, the church seeks but a solitary goal, 
to carry forward the work of Christ under the lead of the befriending spirit. And Christ entered this world to give witness to the truth, to rescue and not to sit in judgment, to serve and, and not to be served. To carry out such a task, Gaudium et Spes says, the church has always had the duty of scrutinizing the signs of the times and of interpreting them in the light of the gospel. End of quote. The following are some aspects of the concrete situation of the Maltese islands and a Catholic population for which our guidelines are intended. Of the total population of 440,000, we're really an island polis, as you know. An estimated 90% would describe themselves as Catholics. Civil divorce and consequent possible remarriage was introduced in 2012, five years ago, after the proposal prevailed in a referendum. Couples in, in inverted commas, irregular situations used to cohabit with no civil status. A number of these couples would apply for a declaration of nullity of their previous marriages with a 50% chance of success. Marriage breakdown and nullity proceedings are unfortunately often experienced as feuds between the respective extended families, much in the Sicilian style. Uh, and, of this, and this negatively impacts the outcome of marriage nullity cases. It is not rare to meet cases where innocent parties have been denied a fair trial because of the refusal of witnesses to cooperate or because of a disservice to the truth in the testimony available. In this context, a number of genuine cases of marriages that were objectively null received a decision that the case was not proven or a non constare. This particular almost specific scenario clearly demands consideration, attentive consideration, in the discernment of specific human narratives. The third principle concerns discernment as the search for the will of God in one's concrete circumstances. Pope Francis refers to this principle a number of times in Amoris Letitia, chapter 8, especially in number 300. Saint John Paul II had also referred to the same principle as we know in Familiaris Consortio 84. In, in retrospect, one may interpret the guidelines of the Maltese bishops as an expression of the discernment that Pope Francis is exhorting the bishops to show in the exercise of their pastoral ministry in his address, in fact, to the new bishops on 14th September 9, 2017, not 1917, 2017. Pope Francis spoke about the process of authentic discernment. He stated that one of the main tasks of the bishop is to offer to the flock entrusted to him that spiritual and pastoral discernment which is necessary in order to achieve the knowledge and fulfillment of the will of God in which all fullness, pienezza, is found. And I will, I've chosen a, a, a few quotes from this extraordinary synthesis on discernment which the Pope offered to the new bishops only a few days ago on the 14th of September. First of all, he says, discernment therefore implies humility and obedience, these two virtues. Humility, the Pope says, with respect to one's own projects or one's own perspective. Obedience, says the Pope, with respect to the gospel, the ultimate criterion, to the magisterium that safeguards it, to the norms of the universal church that are at its service, and to the real situations of persons for whom one takes from the treasures of the church that which is truly relevant and fruitful for the, their present needs, for the present needs of their salvation. Quanto è più fecondo per l'oggi della loro salvezza. It's very difficult to translate this beautiful Italian phrase. Quanto è più fecondo per l'oggi della loro salvezza. Discernment, the Pope says, is an antidote of the immobility 
if of this is what we have always done or let's take some more time. Rather, it is a creative process that is not hemmed in by the application of structures. It is an antidote against rigidity because the same solutions are not valid everywhere. And the, another point here, uh, and this is an extraordinary quote from the same address of the 14th of September, we need the process to force ourselves to grow in an incarnate and inclusive discernment that dialogues with the conscience of the faithful that must be formed and not substituted, and he refers to Amoris 37. This should be accomplished during a process of patient and courageous accompaniment so that each person's ability, the faithful, the family, priest, community and society that is, Everyone is called to move forward in the freedom to choose and fulfill the good that is willed by God. Indeed, the Pope says, the activity of discernment is not reserved for the wise, the perspicacious, or for the perfect. Rather, God often resists the proud and chooses to reveal himself to the humble ones instead. And the last quote from this extraordinary synthesis the Pope says, the one condition essential to move forward in the process of discernment is educating oneself in the patience of God and to his timing. That is never ours. He does not, a quote from Luke 9, command fire to come down from heaven and consume the unbelievers. Nor does he allow the zealots to uproot the weeds from the field they see growing among the wheat. It is expected of us daily to accept from God the hope that preserves us from every generalization because it permits us to discover the hidden, hidden grace in the present without losing sight of the forbearance of his plan of love that transcends us. The fourth and last principle concerns the irreplaceable role of conscience. As Gaudium et Spes teaches, and I won't quote <laughs> Gaudium et Spes 16, um, Bishop Overbeck has already quoted. But I will quote a comment by one of our professors of moral theology, Monsignor George Grima. He says, he was commenting um, in an interview actually to a German newspaper, uh, the Tagespost, Katholische Zeitung für Politik, um, who were interested in, in the Maltese guidelines. Um, and he says, priests um, are not being called to replace, but to enlighten consciences, even if conscience remains, as Aquinas says, the immediate norm of what one is to do in the particular circumstances, it needs to be enlightened. In accompanying persons in irregular or as Amoris also says complex situations. A priest represents an authorized person with whom one can dialogue and from whom one can hopefully receive assistance in finally deciding what is the right thing to do in the situation. The assumption here is that a decision taken in conscience would be a considered decision. Aquinas' notion of conscience as the immediate norm can be helpful in trying to understand the relation of conscience to moral norms in general and to those norms which form an integral part of the Christian life. Conscience can never be right if it operates outside a normative framework. But conscience functions well as long as it does not withdraw from reality, however complex and messy it may be and if it does not reduce itself to judging whether or not an individual's actions correspond to a general law or rule. A reductive understanding of conscience, Pope Francis says, is not enough to discern and ensure full fidelity to God in the concrete life of a human being. Amor is 304. To conclude, were the words of Pope Francis in Amor is 305. Discernment must help to find possible ways of responding to God and growing in the midst of limits. 
by thinking that everything is black and white, we sometimes close off the way of grace and of growth and discourage parts of sanctification which give glory to God. Let us remember that a small step in the midst of great human limitations can be more pleasing to God than a life which appears outwardly in order but moves through the day without conf confronting great difficulties. And that's a reference to Evangelii Gaudium 44. The practical pastoral care of ministers and of communities, the Pope says, must not fail to embrace this reality. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we move from the experience of two prelates who have been quite actively involved in producing guidelines and implementation to thoughts from one of our own prelates here in the United States who's actively engaged in thinking about where we go and what theologians here might contribute to the process too. So Archbishop Wilton Gregory. It is both a welcome opportunity and an equally daunting task to be the final speaker on the concluding panel on the closing day <laughs> of a conference such as this. Those who have already addressed us have looked at the papal exhortation from a variety of different perspectives. In preparing my address, I chose to consult with several successful seasoned pastors, one of whom asked me why I had turned to him. And I told him, because you are a successful seasoned pastor. His response was, Archbishop, you make me sound like a chicken. <laughs> I want to use my limited time here to present comments that are driven by pastoral issues rather than by academic interests. While the Holy Father has presented a clear summary of all of the elements of the church's traditional doctrine on marriage in his exhortation, what has drawn the special interests of the pastors, pastoral ministers, and many people in the Archdiocese of Atlanta has been the pastoral implications of this document. How has Amoris Laetitia been received by those who know the territory of marriage and family life? From my conversations with experienced and successful pastors and pastoral ministers since the publication of Amoris Laetitia, I can say that it has received the stamp of pastoral authenticity from those who know the territory. There are a number of factors that contribute to this favorable reception from those who are immersed in the pastoral care of families today. I will briefly describe two of those factors that give the exhortation such pastoral credibility. The first characteristic of the document that I will mention is the focus on reality. Early in this document, Pope Francis makes it clear that he intends to, and I quote, focus on the concrete realities of marriage and family in society today. Article 31, 301. In a later paragraph, he refers to a statement in the Relatio of the 2014 Synod that pastoral outreach to families today cannot be, and I quote, content to proclaim a merely theoretical message without connection to people's real problems. Number 201. 
even though the Holy Father acknowledges that he has considered his own experience in writing this document, the text clearly shows that he has also listened carefully to the real pastoral concerns and issues expressed by the participants in the two synods on the family. In chapter two on the experiences and challenges of families, he notes that he will not attempt to present all that might be said about family today. Number 31. But the description that follows of the realities and challenges facing families today is both exhaustive in its scope and exhausting to think about. This is precisely what all who carry out the pastoral care of families deal with every day. The desires, the needs, and the, re and the problems of real families in the real world. Reading this document, they recognize that the Holy Father is well grounded in the reality of family and society today. The focus on reality in Amoris Laetitia includes more than acknowledging in a general way the real challenges facing families today. There is also a lengthy consideration in chapter eight of what might be called pastoral realism. The Holy Father points out again and again that in no way must the church desist from proposing the full ideal of marriage, God's plan in all of its grandeur. Number 307. At the same time, however, the discernment of what an individual person is capable of, capable of doing at a specific time has to be realistic. In order to determine the most generous response which can be given to God, Article 303, discernment has to include mitigating circumstances, limits to human freedom, individual conscience, and so on. This kind of realism in discernment, which has been long which has long been used by confessors and spiritual directors is now recognized as essential for pastors in their ministry to families. A second factor in the favorable pastoral reception of Amoris Laetitia is the hope that the exhortation gives to those who minister to families and to the people they want to help. There is a kind of pastoral frustration that comes when you have to tell someone who comes to you for help that there is nothing more that I can do for you. Thankfully, through the expanded options for assistance in cases of nullity, more couples in irregular unions have been able eventually to enter into a full sacramental marriage. Most of the pastors that I know see this canonical process as the first option when dealing with many of these situations. However, for many and various reasons, the canonical process does not fit every situation. And that is when no other options seemed to be possible. All of the doors seemed to be closed. With a powerful sense of mercy and compassion, the Holy Father writes that, and I quote, discernment must help to find possible ways 
of responding to God and growing in the midst of limits. Number 305. He challenges the church and its pastors to move beyond thinking that everything is black and white so that we sometimes close off the way of grace and growth. Article 305. Where some have been seen where some have seen dead ends, Pope Francis opens the door to hope. Amoris Laetitia is a document that recognizes the real and serious problems and challenges facing families today. But at the same time, it is a proclamation of hope through the mercy and grace of God. Every pastoral minister wants to give hope to others, hope for healing, hope for transformation, hope for growth, hope for integration and conclusion, inclusion into the community of faith. This message of this exhortation is a most welcome message of hope for pastors and all those who minister to families today. Certainly, there is much more work to be done to carefully analyze and reflect on the teaching of Amoris Laetitiae. We all know that it is not e easy reading and it is not likely to be a bestseller. <laughs> the text is at times, in the words of Francesco Cardinal Coco Palmiero, dense and inorganic, in the sense that the Holy Father's thought does not always follow an organic order. But the focus on reality and on hope that the Holy Father proclaims are key for its reception by pastors and for all those who minister to families today and who regard it as pastorally authentic. Thank you.